Well, hey there, guys, and welcome back. On this week's show, it's our long-anticipated Toys and Joys scale model build. Well, out of all of the shows that I do, I think the most requests I get are for me to do another scale model build series from the Toys and Joys plans. Now, guys, the ones that I've chosen to do for this series are pattern number 121, which is the dump truck, and pattern 124, which is the heavy pup trailer, that basically they go together hand in hand to form one rather large model. Now, this will be an extensive build that I'm planning on doing here. I have had some viewers that have said, hey, you know what, there are some simple pieces there that you skipped when you did this, uh, did this model, but I'm not really sure how to do them. Could you please show them in your next build kind of thing? So we're going to do our best here to cover every single piece regardless of how simple so that we can incorporate all different levels of woodworking skill here in this build series. So. There is a lot to cover, guys. I don't know how long this series is going to be. I don't know how many parts, and I really don't care. It takes what it takes. We'll just keep going till we're done. And, uh, well, you know what? Let's get it started. Now, this is a nine-page set of plans, guys, and this is the revision from May the 2nd of 2013. If your version is different, either earlier or later, don't worry about it. For the most part, they are the same with just a few tweaks here and there. So this very first page gives kind of an overall view. It can help you with some measurement and some placement, as this is a one-to-one -one scale here of the side profile of the truck. We have up here some safety notes and a little bit of instruction. And down here you have this material list and a parts list. I don't pay attention to either one of those because I cut all my stock from rough cut eight quarter stock. I resaw all my own wood here in the shop. And I don't pay attention to any of these parts lists because these are pre-made parts and I make all of my own. So we're gonna skip away from page one. There's nothing to show here. And we're gonna jump right into page two. Now, we're gonna start by making all of the pieces on this page, and I already see a bit of a problem. Up here, we have a little bit of a, an assembly detail, but down here, we see the frame. The frame is just a straight piece of wood. It's 3 eighths by 3 quarter, and a total of 19 inches long with a hole drilled at a certain dimension. Guys, it doesn't say to make two. You'll see over here, this piece says make two, make two, make two, etc. This does not say anything. But if we look here on this view, well, here is our frame piece right here and right here. So that is two pieces. So we want to start with this frame piece and we will make two. And on the off chance that we should ever be making this pattern again, these are your drawings, guys. So why not place a note right here? Make two. There you go. Ready to go. Let's get these cut. Simple table saw cut, guys. A simple rip and then a cross cut with a fine blade to take it down to its length. Measure carefully because this is the basis of the model that everything from here on in sits on. Now, one of the most simple and the most versatile tools you can use in a model build is a good quality steel straight edge. And in this case here, this 3 8 thick material, walnut, that I want to use for the frame is a little off. So instead of using the jointer to flatten the one edge, I'm going to use the table saw. So by using some double-sided tape, I can attach my straight edge to the walnut giving me a perfect reference edge. And then I can just rip it on the table saw as normal using that straight edge against my fence. It will duplicate exactly that straight edge on the opposite side, making my piece of walnut perfectly straight. And then from there, I can rip my two pieces at three quarters of an inch wide. Well, I have not cut these pieces to length yet. Um, there's a reason for that. They are actually 23 inches long. Why would I make them so long when I only need a 19 inch long piece? 
Guys, you need to have a little bit of foresight and look ahead to what the processes are. And if we look here on the plans, we have our spacers. They show the spacers here on this assembly part of the drawing, but as well, we have them up here in the top right hand side, the frame spacers. You need to make four of them. And those four are one and a quarter inches long, but they are three eighths by three quarters of an inch as far as the size of stock. So why not make them at the same time? Now, truth be told, I've actually cut a third piece and you may be wondering what that's for. Well, again, we can look at our plans here and look at our rear springs. We have to make two of them, but their dimensions, three quarters of an inch by three eighths of an inch. However, they are an inch and a quarter long. They are the exact same size as the frame spacers. So we can cut those at the same time as well. We'll already have the setup done. And these are nothing more than simple cuts over at the table saw using your miter fence to square off the end and then cutting your pieces to length. Now, if you are not comfortable cutting an inch and a quarter long piece of stock at the table saw with your miter fence, you can use a setup like I'm using here. And this is just a small parts cutting jig. You may also notice on this side here that there is a gap between my stock block and my stock. And what that gap is for, guys, is to prevent a kickback situation. So if we have our piece of stock here that we want to cut, let's say that we want a four inch piece. Well, your best bet here is to set your fence so that it is actually a couple inches longer than what your piece is. So we're going to set our fence here. Let's just say that we do want a four inch piece. I have a one, two, three setup block here. I'm going to set my stop block on my small parts cutting jig right there. I'm going to mark this at the four inches. In reality, it's six inches. And we know that because we have this here. We don't need this in our cut. So when you go to set up for the cut, you'll place your one, two, three setup block against your stop block, place your stock against your setup block, and then you'll lay your, your scrap to hold your stock down. You can then remove this. And what this does is as you follow through with the cut, it prevents this off cut piece from binding. If you have your stop block completely up to your stock like that, and as you come through, that piece is trying to lift, it's trying to move. And if you go past to the back end of the blade, this is where the kickback can happen and it's going to try to lift it. But when it does, it has nowhere to move. So it will bind against your stop block and just snap it sideways. So you want to, if you're going to use this type of setup, and all this is, it's just a little frame that's set up um, with a, an adjustable stop block. It's just a shop made little jig. But by leaving that space, when that blade tries to move your piece, the piece, instead of binding and shooting out, is going to kind of shoot off to the side a little bit and allow the blade to pass. It gives you that gap. So remember, do not set up your fence on your small parts cutting jig to be tight to your measurement. Give yourself at least a one to two inch gap there to allow the piece somewhere to move. And in a very short period of time, we actually have quite a few of our pieces made for this frame. Um, we have our four spacers, and we also have our two rear springs. We're gonna put those aside for now. We can work on those afterwards. But for now, we have these pieces, and this will form the frame. Now guys, we now need to drill some holes in our frame. And if we look here at our print, the holes are eight and a half inches from the front end of our frame, and they are three eighths of an inch up from the bottom. So in other words, centered. So we are just going to mark those holes carefully, take them over to the drill press after center punching them and drill those one eighth diameter holes. And now just so that we don't mess up during the assembly, um, I'm going to place an F 
on the end of each of these to make sure that we know that's the front because there is a difference. This is eight and a half here. This ends up to be 10 and a half to the back. So at this point, I guess the next piece I want to work on will be the front bumper. And we can see here on the drawing that it is one inch by three quarters of an inch. So we're gonna start there with a blank of one by three quarter. Well, we have our blank cut. It was basically ripping cuts on the table saw to get our thickness and our width, and then using our miter fence to cut it to length. So if we look here on our print, we have a couple things going on here. The very first thing that we have is a two inch wide dado that is three eighths of an inch deep. So we're gonna mark here like this. This is our line at three eighths deep, which is the depth of our dado. And we are now gonna mark at two inches from either side. And then we'll check our measurement of our dado. That should give us um, a two inch dado left in the middle. So we're just gonna square this off and then we're gonna head over to the table saw. Well, for this procedure, I have set my blade height to 3 8 of an inch. That is the depth of our dado. I have marked it here, but I have set my stop block on my miter fence to be two inches from the edge of the blade, and that will strike right on that line. Because this is a six inch piece, and it's two inches in from either side, there's a minimum of blade changing to do, or fence changing, I should say. We will run it through on this side, flip it over, run it through again, and then we just have to move our fence out a notch and then repeat the process. I know there are a lot of you that don't have dado blades, but this is a great way to get the dado done. Now by using that method, of course, we get kind of a rough surface on the inside. It is up to you whether or not you want to sand that. Um, I'll probably use one of my sanding blocks, which is nothing more than sandpaper attached to three quarter inch thick MDF. And I'll probably get in there and level this out. It just makes for a cleaner joint and a cleaner glue joint. But at this point now, we need to cut this little opening in the front lower end of the bumper. So rule of thumb, whenever you're making any of these pieces, is to cut as much as you can while you still have flat reference points. This is still a rectangle for all intents and purposes. We may have cut out that dado and removed that, but it's still square all the way around. So instead of cutting our angle pieces that are up here on the front of the bumper, we want to utilize our square shape and get the whole cut. So. We can see on the drawing here, it's one eighth of an inch up from the bottom. We'll place that mark. It is five sixteenths of an inch wide. So we will place that mark. And it looks like it's five eighths of an inch long on this bumper. So we'll just check our measurement here at five sixteenths to make sure that it's right. And it is. So the easiest way to do this and to make it so that it's perfectly centered, even if it might be a little off on the size, is to do some calculations. So if we take the full length of six inches and we subtract the five eighths width of that hole, that ends up giving us five and three eighths left over. But if we divide that by two, that's two and 11 sixteenths. And that is the measurement that you want to measure in from each side to make that hole perfectly centered. So two and 11 sixteenths, there's one mark right there, come in from the other side at two and 11 sixteenths. And if we square that off on our bumper, one there, and then the next one, like that. There is our hole, and we can measure that. It's centered perfectly on our six inch bumper, and there it is at five eighths of an inch wide. 
So guys, we're going to drill, we've already got the 1 8 drill bit in the drill press. I'm going to drill a pilot hole in this and we're gonna take it over to the scroll saw and carefully cut this out. And in no time at all, you have your bumper hole finished. So now it's time to cut those angles that are on this front sec section of the bumper. Um, they're cut on the three quarter inch side they're a little swanky. We'll have a flat spot here of three and a quarter inches. So I'm one of these guys that likes to mark everything out. And now we just have to decide how we want to cut that. Well, sometimes the simplest pieces can really make your brain hurt. And square dado, fine. Square cutout, fine. I've got this angle here and we have measured it. I have checked it. I've tried several different methods on the table saw. I've set the fence. It was way too sharp of an angle with no way to clamp the piece in place. I tried a taper jig and the taper jig could not adjust enough to get this angle. So we need to keep safety in mind here, guys. This isn't a bumper on a scale model is not worth losing a finger over. So what we're going to do, at least for me, I'm going to cut the majority of this off on the bandsaw, or maybe for me, I'll use the scroll saw, it doesn't matter. We can square up our sanding belt over at the large belt sander, and we are just going to clean it up and sand up to the line. That to me is the safest process here. Um, it's the only one I'm comfortable with at this point in time. It's too sharp of an angle to try anything with any kind of serious power or the ability to take off fingers. So we're gonna go the safe route. We're gonna cut this off almost up to the line and then we'll sand it to finish it off. And check that out. Okay, so it took a little longer, a little extra step uh, with the cutting and then sanding as opposed to just straight up cutting, but I still got all 10 of these, not a single nick, not a single cut, and that's the most important thing. Forget about the piece here, it's all about staying safe and staying healthy when you're out here. So we now need to sand this, guys, and I've said it many times before, nothing is better than a piece of sandpaper glued to a three quarter inch thick piece of MDF. And that will give this a really nice clean sanding, but it will also keep our nice crisp lines that we want. So now that we have that done, we want to take two of our spacer pieces and we're going to move on to our rear springs that we need two of. So at first we need to look at this angle here and the hole. So the first thing we're going to do is drill the hole. And guys, I don't think we need a video of it. We're just gonna take the dimensions off of the drawing. It's a half an inch up to center and centered on the three quarter inch side. Center punch and drill the hole. It is a 3 16 diameter. Where we're gonna get a little off is with these angles that are here on the edges. Guys, this is repeatability now. You saw that this was the safest way to do it, but this is a large piece. These are much smaller pieces. So again, I don't think we need a video of it, but I'm going to duplicate the exact same method that I showed you here. We're gonna cut almost up to the line. I'm gonna use a scroll saw this time, not the band saw, and we're gonna sand them over at the belt sander and finish them off. Well, one thing you may notice while marking out the rear springs is that it does not give a dimension of the top end of this taper right here. While we know the bottom is 7 sixteenths of an inch across, how high up along the one and a quarter inch side does the taper go? You can always measure it from this side of the drawing, guys, and that measurement is three eighths of an inch. Well, we can put those pieces aside and we want to work now on this battery box. Um, guys, this looks a little tricky, but if you take it step by step, you'll be all right. And as I've said, do as many cuts as you can while your piece is intact. So what we want to do for starters is we want to cut this rabbit that's right here. Now that rabbit measures 5 16 deep 
and it is a quarter of an inch wide and that will be here on the top edge. I've got a piece of maple here that is cut one and a half by one and a half by one inch. This was just done at the table saw and the cross cut sled with this being the off cut section. And what we can do is we want to keep the grain along the length of the truck, I think, for this one. So I'm just going to mark out this rabbit at a quarter inch this way, and uh, it'll be five sixteenths of an inch tall. There we go. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this over to the table saw, and just like what we did with the dado here, we're going to cut this rabbit by raising our table saw blade to a height of 5 sixteenths of an inch and we're just going to nibble our way across using the rip fence as our guide. We'll probably cut this edge piece first here just so that we know that we have the edge of our rabbit in the right spot. Well our next cut is going to be this small rabbit right here. And this one measures 1 16th by 1 16th. So we're going to actually lower our table saw blade so that it is only 1 16th of an inch above the table. We will then set our fence so that it strikes at that 1 16th and we'll just run a pass through to cut this very small rabbit. Well, at this point, I have tilted my blade to 45 degrees to the left, and I have placed a mark on my block at 1 and 1 16th of an inch from the edge to represent this measurement right here. And all I'm going to do, guys, is run this through for one pass to cut off this 45 degree angle that's here on the lower half of our piece. And at this point, you should have a piece that looks like this. Now, full disclosure, you may have noticed this angled cut here in that last clip. That was actually a reenactment. I cut it again, even though it was already cut, because my battery died during filming and I didn't get the footage. So just to show you guys the method, I had to reenact it with the same piece. So I wasn't really cutting anything there. I was just going through the motions with the saw running. But either way, you get the idea. So the last thing to do on this piece is to put that 1 16th of an inch kerf all the way around on the three sides. Now we're going to go over to the router table to do that, but you'll see here um, on our print that that has to be three quarters of an inch up. So the very first thing that we're going to do before we head to the router table is I'm going to place that mark at three quarters of an inch up from the bottom so that we know where to set our router table fence. All right, so let's head over, and get a 1 16th diameter straight bit installed in the router table. We're going to set the height, um, which it looks like to be 1 16th of an inch. I'll double check on the prints, and then we can run this through at the router table. Well, I've clamped an auxiliary fence to my existing fence at my router table. I have my 1 16th diameter straight bit raised to the height of 1 16th of an inch. And what I need to do now is run it through on three sides of our piece. Now, normally guys, for any kind of router operation, I would be using push blocks. But for this particular operation, because it's only raised 1 16th of an inch because it's only a 1 16th bit and because it's not a through cut and I have so much extra space to keep my fingers away from the bit, I'm not really concerned about it. So I'm going to run this through on three sides. If you are concerned about that, by all means use push blocks or whatever you can to make yourself feel comfortable. I've told you a million times on the show, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. So I'm going to get these lines routed in here. I'm going to take them nice and slow and I'll show you the results when we're done. And other than a sanding, there is our battery box complete. Um, I know it looks a little difficult on the plans, but you can see, as I just showed you, take it step by step and you shouldn't have any problems. Now I might, might, 
do a little bit of laser engraving on the front of this. I haven't quite decided yet, but if I do, I'll be sure to show you what I came up with. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this week, and it brings us to the end of part one. Guys, it doesn't seem like we've really made a lot of progress, but we had a lot of finicky parts and several procedures to kind of get through. Um, that trying to measure for the 1 16th inch routings around the battery box, some may not quite get how that works. So we need to delve a little bit deeper into it, and that's just fine with me. I don't mind explaining it if there are those of you who are interested in learning it. We have a lot more to do on this. We're not even done page one. It doesn't seem like we're doing anything but spinning our wheels, and those are wheels we haven't even made yet. <laughs> so guys, I hope you're gonna join me for the next parts. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. We have a fantastic audience base, and I'm hoping that you're gonna consider becoming a part of that. Guys, this one's been a lot of fun. It's been a while since I've done a model build. I forgot exactly how much work and how much brain power it takes to make one of these, uh, but I hope that you're enjoying at least the beginning of it, and I hope you're gonna continue to carry on. I hope you're gonna check out these patterns for yourself. I hope you're gonna work along with me and make this model for your own, and more importantly, guys, I hope you're gonna join me again next week when I bring you yet another woodworking video.